All right, let's uh, call to order the regular council meeting here on Tuesday, September 20th. We are at the WC O'Neill Arena Complex in the council chambers. Uh, and as well, we are uh, being able to be viewed through Zoom and through uh, Facebook. So at this particular time, we will uh, get into the agenda. And the first thing is the recording of attendance. I note that all members of council are here with exception of Councillor Blanchard is not online, correct? So uh, we'll make that note. And if he joins later, I'm not sure, then we'll, we'll add him in at the appropriate time. And uh, before we get into the approval of the agenda, I wanted to recognize that we are on the unceded traditional territory of the Besco Tomagadi people. Um, if we get into the approval of the agenda, I'll be looking for uh, a mover to actually amend it. Uh, and the reason being is that uh, we had an email from staff in regards to adding under new business, uh, something under recreation and community services, which would be the appointment of manager of recreation for the town of St. Andrews. So could I have a mover to amend the agenda? I've got Councillor Heenan and a seconder, please. I've got Deputy Mayor Akaji. Uh, I'm not favoring the left. It was two hands on the left this time. Uh, so all in favor of this uh, amendment, please signify by saying aye. That's been amended. So let's approve the agenda now. Mover, please. Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Gumashell. Uh, any, any more discussions on the agenda? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor of approving the agenda, please signify by saying aye. That's everybody. The agenda has been approved. We're going to get into the disclosure of conflict of interest. Uh, I'll start off. I do have one under business, tourism, heritage, and culture. I'll be uh, calling a conflict of interest on BTHC 220902. Um, is there any other conflict of interest at this particular time? Seeing none, checking online to make sure Councillor Hurdle. No, nope, we're good there. All right. Uh, at this time, we're going to move right into uh, the presentations. And uh, I see we have two presenters joining us this evening through Zoom. So we will kick off uh, with probably our CAO's favorite presentation of the year. Uh, this one is by Teed Saunders and Doyle Accounting and Taxation Services. It's a presentation review of the 2021 Municipal Financial Audit. Uh, for the public's uh, knowledge, we did have a, a session with uh, Teed Saunders and Doyle, uh, a one-hour session where council was able to get a detailed breakdown, have an opportunity to ask a lot of questions, but we wanted to make this presentation available for the public and give council a second opportunity to ask any questions. So at this particular time, um, we'll pass the, uh, the floor over. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. Thank you, um, council, uh, for, for having me here this evening. Um, and I will also uh, share my screen so that we can have a quick, now we, we're not gonna be an hour tonight. This will be a, a fairly high level um, overview of the audited statements where we did spend a fair bit of time uh, last Thursday. Uh, so just a quick overview of what our, our job is as the external auditors, um, we come in and examine the books, the internal records of the town um, to make sure that the town is in compliance with uh, what we call Canadian public sector accounting standards. Um, and once we've done our audit, we then issue these audited financials, which you see uh, here. Uh, and to that we include is our independent auditor's report, um, which goes at near the front of those statements. Um, and so this just indicates that we did uh, in this, there's the, what we call our opinion paragraph uh, that we did find that the town's uh, accounting records were in accordance with Canadian public sector accounting standards. So that's kind of what the province looks for um, when we send the copy of these audited statements off to them uh, to make sure that everything's in good standing. Um, the first statement I'll, I'll run through is just the statement of operations for the year. So this would be the 12 months worth of activity for, 20, for fiscal 2021. Um, the top section there is revenue. So revenue this year was at 6,543,000. Uh, with the largest portion of that being the property tax uh, warrant, which was at 4.2 million uh, compared to 4.144 million last year. So property tax uh, warrant was up about $59,000 over the year before. Um, the next section would be the expenditures. And I should also point out too that included there is also the budget. Um, so these are the budget amounts for the various items. Um, total expenditures for the town this year were at 5,938,000. So up from last year was at 5.29 million. Um, and 
with the expenses at 5.9 million, revenue at 6.5 for public sector counting standard purposes, uh, the surplus this year was 604,745. Now, with respect to that, under Canadian public sector counting standards, standards, there are a few differences um, with what we call the funding surplus. Um, and the funding surplus would be basically what you base your annual uh, property tax warrant on, um, as well as setting your uh, user rates for water and sewer. Um, so in your general operating fund this year, the, uh, the funding surplus on that account was 69,334. And in the water and sewer operating uh, fund, it was $19,989. So there are a few differences between what we're showing as a public sector surplus versus the actual what we call funding surplus. Um, the unrealized gain on investments, so that's within the reserve funds. Uh, so every year we make an adjustment to those from the book value to market. Um, and the, at the end of 21, stock market was up. So there was what we call an unrealized gain uh, on your reserve funds of 167,000. So overall the, uh, the Public sector accounting surplus this year was 771. Uh, surplus at the end of last year was 26,288. So when we add this year's surplus to that, it puts your surplus at the end of the year at $27,060,000. Uh, and so what the surplus is quickly, um, on the statement of consolidated financial position, uh, you can see there that your assets at the end of the year, which would include cash, uh, your accounts receivable, uh, and your reserve fund investments, those totaled $4.865 million. Uh, under your liabilities, there was a trade, uh, what we we'll call accrued liabilities, trade payables are at $799,000. Deferred revenue, uh, that's basically funds that have been received by the town uh, and for specific purposes uh, and have not been spent yet. So when those projects um, happen, the money gets drawn down out of that deferred revenue. Uh, Long-term debt was at 5.3 million this year. That's the uh, debentures that the town has. Um, and this year we added, uh, there was new debenture, new borrowing of 755,000 and then repayments of 506,000. Uh, and then there's a retirement allowance liability there that would be for uh, retiring employees for future, that's a future liability. Um, so when we add those up, total liabilities are at 7,190,000. Uh, and when we subtract that off of the, uh, the financial assets of the town, there's a net debt there of 2,324,000. Um, and then really where your accumulated surplus comes in, it's, it's really the capital assets or what we call tangible capital assets of the town. So that includes the things, buildings, roads, streets, um, land. Um, and you can see there the cost base of the town's assets is 50,069,000. Um, and then what we're doing is each year we depreciate or amortize uh, some of those assets to recognize that they are a year older. And so to date, um, there's been 20,689,000 recognized as amortization, which puts the net value of the town's assets at 29,379. So when we say accumulated surplus, what we're really, what it really is, it's the town's equity that it has in its assets and its tangible capital assets. Um, and one of the other things that we look at too as part of the audit, we look at your debt service ratio. So that's basically um, the percentage of the town's budget, uh, or sorry, the expenditures that goes towards servicing the debt. Um, so debt servicing would include interest payments as well as principal payments. Um, and so this year in your general fund, that debt service is at 4.9%. Um, and kind of the cap or the where the province would, you know, the higher end of that would be considered around 20%. Um, so at 4.9%, the town is in as well under um, what, the, what the province would consider to be a high debt service. Um, and in your water and sewer fund, the uh, debt service is at 23.4%. And under water and sewer guidelines, you can actually, debt service cap is about 50%. So you're well within that one that one as well. So we always like to look at that just to make sure that that you're not uh, that a town or a municipality is not uh, over leveraging itself with debt. Um, so the town is in good shape with respect to that. 
Um, so that's really it for the body of the statements. As you mentioned, Mayor, we did go through them in a fair bit of detail uh, on Thursday. So um, if anybody has any questions on these statements, I'd be more than happy to address that. Thank you, appreciate that, Peter. Uh, is there any questions from staff or any member of council? Again, we did have the opportunity to ask several. Uh, there is no question, so I wanted to say thank you very much. And uh, I, I know that some of the things that we highlighted in the presentation was that the town's debt service ratio is well within kind of industry standards, uh, actually a little bit lower when it comes to the operational side. And uh, the other thing that was highlighted is that uh, the, you know, the staff uh, did an excellent job in helping prepare for it. So I wanted to kind of highlight those as two things that you, that you highlighted with us uh, on our hour presentation. So there's no questions, but I'll, I'll let you know, Peter, that the first motion that we have this evening is actually approving it. I don't know if it makes sense for him to stay online and there's not really any questions. I don't know if there's a need, your comment for you. I don't think there's a need. Anyone need uh, him to be online for that motion? Okay, you can jump off if you want or stick around. All right. Very exciting meeting ahead. <laughs> I think my supper's ready, so I gotta go. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you very much. And, and just a second, what you what you said, Mayor. Uh, just thanks, big thanks to Chris and the town staff as well. Um, it makes our job a lot easier when the accounting records are uh, are in good shape, which they were. Thanks again for walking us through it. Have a, have a good right. week. Thank you. All right, we're moving on. The next presentation will be made by Tressa Bevington in regards to Compass Housing Inc. It is the site plan presentation for 302 Mo Drive. I see that uh, Tressa's on as well. So we'll pass the floor over to Tressa. Welcome. Tressa, you're good. It's, you're still muted, I believe. That's right, how's this? We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you so much for your um, time tonight and letting me present the site plan that I have worked really hard on with my team um, at Spitfire. And also I wanna say a big thank you to Xander for all of his help uh, guiding us to make sure that we're making the right decisions um, and the right placement of the building on the lot. Uh, I assume, yeah, thank you, Paul, for putting that up there. Uh, so what you see is the location on Moat Drive. Um, the total lot is two acres that we have on there. So we've really worked really hard to maximize the space while still keeping uh, a lot of the trees that are on site and a lot of the nature that we do have. We just wanna make sure that that's highlighted on there as well because it's a little difficult to, to see with the site plan. Um, as you'll see, the building that we have, it's 385 feet by 53 feet uh, for the 42 units that we do have planned in there. Um, we also have, you'll notice, uh, parking spaces that we have. Uh, as per St. Andrew's requirements, we would need 53 parking spots, but we have 60 parking spots on site. We just think it's important to have as much parking as possible. Uh, since there is nowhere else to park, they can't really park on the street on Moat Drive or anything. So we want to make sure we have lots of parking for our tenants on there. Uh, the way that it was designed and placed on site, we do not need any variances um, from the town, uh, which is a big, which is a big help and a big thanks to Xander to help us to reach that goal. Um, some other highlights that I just wanted to point out is. Uh, we do have a, our amenity space at the lower part of the lot um, that will be there, but we will also have uh, balconies in each apartment. They're just not represented yet. So I wanted to make sure that we had amenity space as per the bylaws, um, required bylaws. Um, also, the other thing that I wanted to point out is there's a little squiggly line to the right of the trail. Paul, I don't know if you can zoom in there, but that's our proposed trail as we did say that we would um, have a trail connecting the subdivision to Moat Drive so that people are able to access if they're walking through, um, if they're walking through to Moat Drive. Um, that's really all that I have to say about the site plan. I'm really eager to hear what council thinks and I'm here for any questions that anyone might have on this, but I just thank you for the opportunity to present the site plan to you guys tonight. Thank you very much for sharing that. Council does have a copy of that. And as well, I uh, I think Mr. Dopper's trying to zoom in. I'm. It's a little squeaky, like yeah. halfway. 
the one that I can't see is the trail right now. I don't know if you could help us with that, Mr. Knopper. Can you guys? Yeah, see it? it says it says proposed trail, like halfway to the right of the parking lot. I don't know if Paul can. <laughs> it's it's very tiny. There's like five squiggly lines there. Oh, it is the yellow. Okay. All right. Yeah. I do see that. <laughs> oh, Perfect. no, no, the yellow, no, the yellow is no storage. It's actually like the, see the five squiggly lines? Paul, if you just move up, see where it, it's like where the, it's like where the main entrance of the building is right there. There. Yes, Paul, oh, you got oh, it. Oh, sorry. I got, I got you now. It's in the back yes. center of it. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I was looking towards towards that yellow box. So it's in the back center. Yeah, that's the snow storage area. You go, on you the go site right in there. Yeah. That's it, right? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. All right. So the, basically people would just walk into the driveway and then around uh to access. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. That was one of my questions as well. The other one was about uh landscaping in the front. It sounds like you're gonna try to work with the deer eating trees in the front of the property. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's our plan. And uh, the other thing I noticed uh, is when we originally talked about it, I didn't know the parking would be in the front or the back, but it looks like, as we could clearly see here, it's in the back facing the building uh, versus the properties. Uh, and uh, council, do you have any specific questions on the site plan? They will have questions for staff about next steps, but any member of council have any questions on this? All right, uh, just... Yep, go ahead. I can't quite uh, make it out in the the black and yellow zone. Is that like an electrical zone or? That's a snow storage. Like if there's any snow pile or something as we're cleaning up for winter. And just um, where is Anchors Landing like in relation to this? We were trying to zoom in. Uh, yes. Sorry about that. It was a dated. It's uh, the, yeah, it's. Yeah, I get I get that, but like like roughly, how far? How far over? is the um it's yeah. about uh like there's still going to be a tree line between the two properties okay um yeah and then where it's at, where the black and yellow is like i would say it's not even close to that it's still the parking lot is quite a ways away from there still so we because we want to keep that line of trees between the two properties if i'm so. not mistaken there's a there's kind of a ditch through there a lot, a lot of water drains down in through there it might be yeah, Good. there is. Yeah. Preserve that. Yes. Oh, yeah. No. And we need to for the runoff. But yeah, that's where uh, we have a ditch there. And like I said, there is that tree line that we want to keep um, keep in there to separate the two properties. Oh, OK. And uh, just a question, because I think it uh, it makes it less intrusive to the neighborhood. But right now, currently on that lot, there's two entrances to it. And I note that you're building this one using one. Was there a particular strategy behind that? Um, we just thought if we did one, it was just easier to manage uh, traffic. Okay. So we just thought just having one coming in and out, and then also you don't have people driving in and driving out of the other driveway. Yeah. That makes so sense. So we just thought it just Not a turnaround spot. That wasn't right on. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for staff, I guess. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I got counselor. Thank you. Uh, I see a small hand up there now, Councillor Ertle. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> it's been a long time since so I had to look forward. I get it. it's usually to the left. Um, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, I'm just curious because I see where the parking lot uh, exits onto Mowat. I'm wondering if, um, if it makes more sense to do it that way or to make more of an intersection with Thomas. Uh, if you've looked at those as both proposals and found this way to be safer. Um, Xander, do you want to speak to that? Because Xander and I spoke about that when we were designing the site. Um. It, it, I can really only speak to what would be required in the zoning bylaw and it doesn't, it, there, there would be a requirement if there was a road on that same side, but because it's on the only on the other side, it doesn't really matter how far the driveway is from it. Um, and I'm not really a traffic engineer. I don't, I don't think Thomas is a very frequently used street. So, um, I, my guess is with the stop sign, that would probably be, be fine at the, uh, the corner there. But um, I, I think given, yeah, the traffic volume on Thomas, it's, it's not a huge concern either way. 
am I guessing that the advantage of putting it where it is is it gives it gives more buffer to the SR zone on that side. So if you put the driveway in, it would be closer to that. I, I know that it would be still within, but it would be a lot closer to the house at that point. Yeah, versus... it definitely it definitely would be. So that that is an advantage of having it on this side. So, yeah, it was true. Trista, just a quick question. We talked about at some point that you're going to have a walkway that would go like out to the curb so that you could transfer, then we could put a crosswalk across to the sidewalk, which is on the other side of the road. I don't mm -hmm. see that shown on the site plan, but I could be missing it. No, we didn't We didn't put that in yet, but that's at the top of our minds with planning where that is. But we didn't, you're not missing it. It's not on there right now. Okay, thank you. Yes. For planning for the town, that almost makes sense to take it from their driveway to directly across Thomas Avenue, because I don't think you put a crosswalk right before the inner, for Thomas Avenue intersection, would you? We'd have to look, Your Worship. The only thing, I'd argue against that, if you get it away from the driveway, it might make it a little safer. Okay. You know, if people aren't seeing, but you're right. Everything will have to be considered, but we had talked about it. So that'd be a very saying, small distance. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and whatever's easiest for the proponent too, because like you said, there's a tree line there along Mowat that we don't necessarily want to cut down in order or cut partially in order to put an entryway. So we'll look at it. I was just seeing if it had been planned on at this point, but that's okay. We can follow up in the development stage. Perfect. So for next steps for the public's information, I think we're going to be doing a second hearing of objections is what council decided. Question is, is, should the design on the outside be determined before we go to that so people can see not only the site plan, but also what it's going to look and feel like? That'd be our recommendation, Your Worship. It's okay. just, you know, there's still a lot of interest in the community about the final. And so this is one step that'll help the neighbors, but it's still to get an idea. She had mentioned about uh, that they're going to have uh, patios on several of the units, yep. which hadn't been shown in the earlier plans. So it, you know, really, we need like a good outside look and kind of a final outside design to see what's there, I'd say, before going to the public hearing again. Perfect. So the next steps would be, uh, if that works to the developers, would be the outside design, and then that comes before council, and then we set the hearing objections, or is that? Yeah. Okay. Does that work for everybody here? All right. Is there any other questions? I would counsel Uh Further to uh, Xander's point, not being a, a traffic engineer, um, there, there are existing there's existing two entrances so um just wondering if it wouldn't be lead to less congestion if they're and easier for the residents and da 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 if it would continue to be two entrances there's already breaks in the in the hedge and in the the uh the sidewalk culvert or the uh curb rather so i think it's uh i i think it's a bit of a does that extend down further than the second? Uh, I think the concerns is it becomes a, a loop around, uh, like people cut in there to loop around and go back. You know what I mean? It becomes, if you have two ways, it just becomes almost like a drive through. You know what I mean? But is that what you want? Well, I, yeah, well, no, but for, for just general people driving in and stuff like that, I don't know if it's necessarily what they'd be looking for versus control, but it is a, it is a valid point is you'd have half the traffic going through one driveway in theory, right? As a result of that. We just felt that having people like knowing some people, they'll just drive through it as a, a drive through, or like you said, as a turnaround. And we just want to minimize any high flying traffic through there since there are going to be families living there as well. So that's why we just stuck with the one driveway. Thank you. Yeah. It should be noted to your worship that in between the neighbor as you approach the outskirts of town there's a significantly less uh room to the property line so it'd be significantly closer to them to, than to the neighbor on the town side closer to the town center so um you know it'd be less infringement to so this side as opposed to the other yeah okay your worship you have councillor hurdle yeah councillor hurdle uh, thank you, Mr. Popper, and your worship. Um, um, so I guess my, my question is, is uh, still on the same topic, and uh, sorry to belabor the point, but what I, when I look at this, I see a lot of people would be going to, say, Tim Hortons, for example, on foot, and as a council, I think we want to encourage more people to be on foot and possibly on a bicycle for active transportation reasons, so they'd have to cross the street there. And my concern, again, just to, just to say, is, is if you're crossing the street um, and you're looking for traffic, 
on on Mo. If you're looking for traffic in and out of that driveway, you're looking for traffic coming from Thomas as well. Um, is there a concern there? And, and I think I'd just like to get ahead of that if there is one. Yeah, it's uh, again, not a traffic expert. Either. The way that I look at this is uh, I access through the bar road every day. And the bar road goes directly onto Mowat Drive and you've got um, Minister's Island there with the tourist attraction that attracts over 30,000 visitors a year. And plus there's probably a hundred plus homes now in that subdivision. Well, maybe not quite a hundred, but there's 50 plus homes in the subdivision. Uh, with Anchors Landing, you you're probably are close to a hundred different dwelling units. And I personally, when I go in the morning, I know there's two ways out of there, but I've never been backed up any more than three cars any time of year. And I can usually pull out there within 30 seconds. So um, although this would add more traffic to it, I, I just, I don't really think it would be a congestion issue at all. And the fact that it's affordable housing, it makes me think that probably half the owners of these particular, sorry, tenants probably won't have vehicles anyway. They'll be on foot would be, again, that's an assumption, but I don't think everyone that lives there is going to have a car. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't have the answer. I guess the real question is, is it better to come out directly towards Thomas Avenue is what you're wondering. So that way it's like a, a two way a stop on each side versus right before it, I think is what you're wondering. Is that correct? Well, no, I'm just more concerned. Like if, if we do look at it this way and if you're on foot and you don't have clear guidelines of how, how, how and where to cross the street there, um, you gotta be looking at multiple different angles that, to, is that going to be a safety concern if you're on foot or on a bicycle? Um, I, I just think we should probably possibly uh, just look and see what the sight lines would be with this and um, just be aware that it, there could be a safety concern. Yeah, uh, I think looking at the sight lines would be good. It is the existing driveway pretty much of what was there for the motel. Um, it is, yeah. I, Xander, if you have any idea on the sight lines or any concerns? Um. I think it would be possible to run a crosswalk from the edge of it would it would just sort of run parallel with Thomas and it would it could meet either further down but I think a clear crosswalk I think that would solve any safety issues there's clear clearly signed that this is a pedestrian crossing and um you know look both ways um I you could run it from the corner of Thomas to where that driveway is, and it would it would be a straight line. Um, so I, I think as long as it's clear, there wouldn't be a huge safety concern. Perfect. Oh, Councillor Heenan. Yes, Your Worship and Council. Probably this question is more directed to Steve, Councillor Neal, um, about fire protection with just one driveway. Is there an issue with coming in and then turning about and coming back out, like if we had a fire? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't really see right offhand any issues there. No, that's good. Um, looking at that, typically, again, uh, from a public safety standpoint with regards to fire service, you're looking for coverage on three sides. Right which you would have there via Moat Drive in the driveway and the parking lot behind. So I think this would meet the standards. Thank you. <coughs> well, thank you, Your Worship. <coughs> Any other member of council? I see. Uh, do <coughs> are you saying one moment, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Bevington, or are you uh, got a question? <coughs> I just want to make a comment. <laughs> just one second. I saw her hand up. <laughs> One moment, one sec. We'll give her just a moment. I just need one second <clears throat> to say something. <laughs> Sorry, I'm good now. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make a um, point about asking about the outside of the building because that process is very different than uh, what we prepared for you for this site today. And that would take us, that's gonna take me into December before I'm gonna have uh, the outside design of the building because as building the outside of the building um, design, it's also the in interior of the building, all the mechanical, all of the systems, the electrical, everything needs to be done at the same time to make sure it works with the design of the outside of the building. So if that's the case, this 
puts the project timeline, it might put it off um, schedule than what we were hoping for. Um, because for the passing of the rezoning, which is what the site plan is for today, um, this is what I needed for the site plan. So I just wanted to throw it out to council to just see if there would be a reconsidering um, and maybe if there's a verbiage that we could put in the development agreement so that that's not held up because um, I need more time to work on that and I will definitely not have that ready for October 17th. Yes, I'll look over to you, staff and, and Xander. I think the concern would be to have a hearing objections is the first thing that probably be asked to council is what is it going to look like? Would that be it? Would that be the challenge that's before us right now? Yeah, because there's also been a lot of people concerned about it's um, fitting into the landscape. Like, you know, a lot of people referring to the Tim Hortons uh, project that took place, you know, 20 years ago and how it was changed in order to, to fit in the neighborhood. So without that, there'll probably be a lot of, you know, people concerned about what that's going to look like. I'm not sure. I, I, well, I'm in sympathetic. I can see that the they were looking for that. And I mean, we've had it with the um, bridal path was able to give us some stuff. So I'm not exactly sure how to overcome, but I'm, I've got concerns. If it isn't available, it's not going to uh, be something that makes the public really happy. Okay, so... Either way, it'll happen. Yeah, go ahead. Mayor Hudson, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to say too, um, that anything that we designed, what I <clears throat> put out to you guys before was uh, a rendering from a place in Moncton. I just wanted to show, just to indicate, to let people know that it was gonna be two floors and it wasn't gonna be higher than the two floors. Um, but anything past that, I spoke to Xander about this as well, but for passing this because I'm not on the town plat like the difference with bridal path is that they're in the historic district of downtown whereas I'm not in the historic district of downtown and of course I'm going to make the building look really nice and it's going to fit into the area it's going to be a beautiful home for 42 new families um, but I just don't want to get the project get off <clears throat> off my schedule for something that um, at the end of the day I'm going to be working with the town on this anyways but for this process for the development agreement and for rezoning the site I needed the site plan which I have today so I just don't want to get off schedule just because of something that I might you know that might cause me to get off track when at the end of the day as long as I'm adhering to the bylaws that the town has there will be no there won't be a difference. Okay, so um, either way, there's there's no motion before us for hearing of objections. So what I'd say is maybe take this offline, have some conversations with, with Ms. Bevington and, and find out what your recommendation is to council because we're gonna have to discuss it probably in two weeks anyways, the assumption, because there's no motion for hearing of objections anyway. So, or is there one? There, yeah. Or there is one? I thought it was yeah. bridal. 2006, class. it's your first 2006. one. Because it's supposed to be October 17th, and that's what I was... Oh, that's right. It is 26th. That's what I was preparing to. But honestly, that's going to take a few months. And what I'm trying to say is we are adhering to all the bylaws. We don't need any variances for our property for the site plan. And if we wait for my design to come out and to have public opinion on that, which at the end of the day, I'm going to be adhering to all the bylaws and all the variances, and it's going to be a really nice looking building and fit into the the nature and the structure of the land. I just don't want to delay my project because that's going to be, that will put everything off of all the timelines that we've been working for. Okay, well, we'll uh, I guess we'll have to debate that under the that motion would be the time, yeah, Mr. Spear. Well, your worship, there's, there's still a bit of an issue because as our practice in the past, we've been not doing third reading of the rezoning until we have a development agreement in place. So all this has got to be in place anyway before you go to third reading. So I'm not exactly sure. I'm sympathetic, but it's, you know, the recommendation from the lawyers in the past has always been not to go to third reading till a development agreement is in place. And if we have a development agreement in place, we need those plans anyway, yeah. full set of drawings. So I'm not exactly sure where you want to go with this, but it, the advice is if you're going to a meeting, really, the, 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 it was about the meeting of objections. She's meeting part of the zoning bylaw, but the zoning bylaw, I believe, says that a development agreement has to be in place 
And if that's the case, she needs this other sets of drawings. Your Worship. Uh, just uh, I'll, I'll sort of tell you the legal requirements. So the Community Planning Act, which governs these things, um, council has a lot of power in rezonings and can um, pretty much have anything they request in a development agreement. There's no specific requirement to have renderings or uh, elevations or any of those things in there, but um, it has been the town's practice in the past to have those in there there may be a way to set certain requirements in the development agreement. Um, not that I'm particularly recommending this one, but you could have a requirement for uh, adequate facsimiles of traditional materials on the outside. That would be something more for the historic business district. Um, there, there may be a way to have a development agreement that sets parameters to some degree, um, but it may be something that council just needs to discuss more. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so I guess council, what's your pleasure on this one? Um, really, you can't do the develop. You can't do the development agreement until you have this, or or just what Xander said. It just could be that that brought. I guess you worship. We're going to debate it in a little bit. Maybe you tried to move it forward. We had the presenter here, or so that's going forward. But I mean, at the end of the day. The recommendation is that the development agreement and the third reading of the rezoning happen at same the same time. time. And so what Ms. Bevington is hoping to have the rezoning in place and then work on the development agreement to come with it. But it's our, our really our strongest tool is on the rezoning. Once that's rezoned, then it's then you lose a little bit of the power. So I have a I get what you're saying. Council, um, we're gonna have to debate this one later. Um, is there any other questions? Will we be taking it off it, to just to debate it? Uh, the M well, the MP twenty oh six. When we go back to that motion, that's when we would technically debate it. Um, and of course, there is an option to table and and get our head around that as well. Because um, again, we'll have to see see what council. I don't want to skew anything. Council's pleasure is on this one. Okay. Thank you. So I think we'll we'll revisit it at the motion. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Bevington. Appreciate the presentation, answering the questions, as well as the uh, the site plan as well this evening. Thank you very much, thank and you. we'll be uh, we'll be talking about it later this evening as well. Thank you. All right, uh, last meeting we did take care of approval of minutes, communications, and the staff report, so we can skip over those for this meeting. So that takes us right into the introduction, consideration, and passing of bylaws and motions. Um, and the first one is under finance and administration, uh, Deputy Mayor Akaji. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. Uh, FA 220911. Uh, it's 2021 Town of St. Andrews audited financial statements, Teed Saunders, Doyle accountants and advisors. So the background is this. The audited 2021 financial statements were presented earlier this meeting by Peter Logan, CPA, CA of Teed Saunders Doyle accountants and advisors. The firm is using an unqualified clean opinion that the statements present, present, present fairly the financial position of the town at the end of 2021. So my motion is that council approves the 2021 audit financial statements as presented by our auditors, T. Saunders Doyle, accountants and advisors. And I so move your worship. Thank you, I have a seconder for that motion. Got Councillor Hurdle, give one to the TV, Councillor Neal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, uh, any discussion on this motion? We didn't have any more questions to the presenter, so I will call the question. Oh, Mr. Spear, you want to speak? Well, I could speak for hours, Your Worship, as you know, this is yeah, fascinating stuff for us accountants, but I just wanted to let the public know after it's approved tonight, there's some signatures required and binding, so it probably won't be available for public consumption mm -hmm. until Friday or early next week, but... Uh, they're there and uh, we'll make it even available on our website as soon as we get it all together. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll call the question. All those in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. That's everybody that has been approved. We'll go to the next one. Yeah. So FA 220915. 
and it's the 2021 Town of St. Andrews Annual Municipal Government Governance Report. So the background is this, pursuant to section 105 of the Local Governance Act and regulation 2018-54, Municipal governments are responsible for developing a year in review report. This report contains general information about the town and St. Andrews meetings, provisions of grants and the cost of services that are provided by the town. The document also contains a copy of the 2021 audited financial statements of the town of St. Andrews. The report needs to be approved by council and will be placed on the town website for public view and a hard copy can be provided at town hall for public view. So the motion is this, that council accepts the 2021 Town of St. Andrews Annual Municipal Governance Report as per the Local Governance Act, Act Section 105 and Regulation 2018-54. And I so move this, Your Worship. Thank you. And a seconder for that motion. I'll go left, Councillor Heenan. <laughs> uh, any discussion on this one? Okay, all in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. That's everybody has been approved and we're into your last motion. Thank you very much, Your Worship. FA220917. And this is the medical equipment purchase for St. Andrew's Wellness Center. So the background is this. The St. Andrew's Wellness Center has approached the staff with a request to purchase six new pieces of equipment. They are requesting support for portable blood pressure machine. The current machine does not stay charged and the model is no longer serviced and it is 15 years old. Two ophthalmol op so lamoscope sets used to check retinas, black, back of eyes, optic nerves, etc. Two gynecological, gynecolic, oh boy, that's no, that's specific lights and new photocopier. Well, that's easy to say. New photocopier printer fax machine. Please see the attached documents to this motion and report for a medical equipment note, quote, on the equipment being requested. But the total talk cost with tax is $5,008.72. It is estimated that the new photocopier would be approximately $500. Staff have reviewed the budget for 2022 and have identified $10,000 that was set aside for doctor recruitment that could be used this year to purchase the, re that the requested equipment items. So the motion is this, that council approves the purchase of one portable blood pressure machine, two ophthalmological scopes, two gynecological specific spec lights and a photocopier fax machine at a cost of $5,700 HST included for the St. Andrews Wellness Center. And I so move your worship. Thank you, a seconder for that motion, Councillor Gumashell. Any, any discussion on this one? I think it's, I think okay. it's very, yeah, I think uh, Go ahead those, if you want. those yep. um, machines are necessary, especially the ones 15 years old. It's not as old as ours, but it is old. Yep. Any <laughs> other comment? Okay. Nope. I'll call the question. All in favor of approving this motion, please signify again by saying aye. And that is everybody. So that uh, motion has been carried as well. And we're on to public works. I know that Councillor Blanchard is not here this evening, uh, and Councillor Neal has nothing under his portfolio, and he's coughing, so I thought I might just put it to him at this point. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, this is FA220916. The subject is Council Support for the Application to the Natural Infrastructure Fund. Uh, Infrastructure Canada has released the Small Projects Fund through Natural Infrastructure Fund from the Government of Canada. This fund supports projects that use natural or hybrid approaches to protect the natural environment, support healthy and resilient communities, and contribute to economic growth and jobs. Using natural and hybrid infrastructure systems, the fund intends to bring benefits from projects for increasing climate change resilience, mitigating carbon emissions, improving the environment, contributing to cleaner air and water, 
protecting and preserving biodiversity and wildlife habitats and promoting people's access to nature. The shoreline of St. Andrews has been identified in the Climate Change Adaptation Plan from 2019, Municipal Plan Zoning Bylaw through the Sea Level Rise Maps and the recently updated Provincial Sea Level Rise Maps as in need of priority protections against climate change. Staff is recommending that the Town of St. Andrews apply to the fund for enhancing and protecting the shorelines of St. Andrews for climate change resilience, protecting and improving biodiversity, and people's access to nature. The goal would be to raise and secure the shorelines of St. Andrews along street ends and raise and secure the shoreline along Indian Point Park to the nature preserve. Staff have, has been in contact with the Passamaquoddy First Nations and the Nature Trust of New Brunswick for support on the project. The fund would cover up to 80% of the costs of the $1 million in funding. The motion reads that council supports the application to the Natural Infrastructure Fund through Infrastructure Canada for a coastal shoreline protection project for climate change adaptation and sea level rise using natural and hybrid infrastructure in the town of St. Andrews. And I so move your worship. Thank you very much. A seconder for that, Deputy Mayor Akaji. Um, discussion on this one? Okay, seeing none, so I'll call the question. All in favor of, of this motion, please signify by saying aye. Sorry, that is everybody. That motion has been carried as well. And you're on to the next one, uh, Councillor Neal. Thank you, Your Worship. The next one is PW220911. And the subject is Surplus Public Works Equipment 2022. The background reads that the Town of St. Andrews is looking to move the following pieces of equipment to surplus for the purpose of selling to the public. A Toyota forklift, an Evinrude 25 horsepower outboard motor, a Mercury 25 horsepower outboard motor, a 1987 Olympia ice resurfacer, 16 foot wooden sea boat, and a 2012 Chevrolet Colorado four wheel drive truck. The equipment is in various states of repair and will be sold as is, where is. So the motion reads that council declares the following equipment items to be surplus for the purposes of sale. One, the Toyota forklift, operational. Two, the Evinrude 25 horsepower outboard motor. Three, the Mercury 25 horsepower outboard motor. Four, the 1987 Olympia ice resurfacer. Five, the 16 foot wooden sea boat. And six, the 2012 Chevy Colorado four wheel drive truck. And I so move your worship. Thank you. And once again, we've got a seconder with Deputy Mayor Akaji. And he, sorry, with Councilor Kubashell. Uh, any questions on this one? Okay, might be a chance for someone to own their own Zamboni. All in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 And did I see Councillor Hurdle's hand as well? It might have disappeared in the background. Are you in favor as well, Councillor? Perfect. Five zero. Someone has a chance to get a Zamboni. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Neal. Uh, Councillor Blanchard owes you one. At this time, we're going to go on to business, tourism, heritage, and culture, and I will be declaring a conflict of interest on this one. So if you just give me a moment to step aside, I'll look for Deputy Mayor Akaji to just chair this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. <coughs> just give him time to get out of the room. He's old. Could be mine next, though. No? Okay, Councillor Hurdle, uh, would you please run us through this? Thank you very much. I'm just going to test that you guys can hear me. There are new headphones. I'm not sure if I can hear loud and clear. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is reference BTHC220902. And the subject is the request for Peddler's Permit St. Andrews Brewing Company, October 1st, 2022. The town of St. Andrews has received a request from the St. Andrews Brewing Company to bring in a food truck as part of their 2022 Oktoberfest celebration scheduled for October the 1st and 2nd. They are looking to operate a food truck. 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. each day, which will serve sausages on a bun and schnitzel. The truck would be located behind the brewery along King Street. Under bylaw number 75, a bylaw regulating and licensing peddlers and transient traders, the clerk has the authorization to issue permits under this bylaw. Councils of the past have put a moratorium on food trucks in town with the goal of driving traffic to local restaurants and establishments. Typically, Food truck permits are only issued for larger community events like Battle Fest and Indulge. In following the bylaw, uh, staff would not recommend a permit be issued based on the previous decisions of council and allowances for food trucks only at large community events. 
as the Oktoberfest is not a des designated large community event, the permit should not be issued based on bylaw processes. Uh, staff has reached out to local restaurants within the area to pull them on the potential of a food truck. From comments received, they are in support of the food truck as it does not compete with already established menus and serve items. If council wishes to allow a food truck for the event, a motion granting permission to allow a food truck would be needed, uh, whether we allow it or don't allow it. And the motion before us is that council either allows or doesn't allow uh, a permit to be issued under the bylaw 75A uh, bylaw to regulating and licensing peddlers and transient traders to the St. Andrews Brewing Company for October 1st and 2nd, 2022. So I guess we have to figure that out before we move on this. So we need a seconder and then we need to discuss whether it allows or does not allow, or does that go first? Well, why don't we just use one or the other? So why don't we just say allows, then you can defeat it just so there's clarity instead of putting either or there? Okay, so the motion before us then would be that the council allows a permit to be issued under bylaw 75A, bylaw to have regulating and licensing peddlers and transient traders in the St. Andrews Burn Company for October 1st and 2nd, 2022. And I so move. Okay, thank you. I We need a seconder. Councillor Gumashel has seconded that. Any uh, discussion on this, Council? Councillor Gumashel? Um, it says that uh, staff has reached out to local restaurants and uh, from the comments received, they are in support of the food truck for this weekend. Okay, thank you. Councillor Heenan? Yes, Deputy Mayor and Council. Um, I was just looking at the calendar and that's for Saturday and Sunday night, I do believe. Am I correct on that? Yes. Um, I just wonder about the time frame of 12 a.m. Like, I'm not sure. I, I really personally think that that's a little late. I have no problem uh, with the food truck area. I just think that 12 a.m. is a little late, especially on a Sunday evening. I mean, that would be my only objection. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hurdle. Uh, anybody else? Councillor Neal? Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I think I would tend to agree with Councillor Hurdle on that one. Um, again, I think they're, if I remember, their typical operating hours are 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. So, again, I, I don't think I'd have an issue with the 12 a.m. on the Saturday night, but perhaps on Sunday night we could reduce it a little yes. bit. Okay. Other than that, I don't really have any objection to it. If the local restaurants are in favor of it, they're in, I don't see any opposition. Am I allowed to speak? No. When I'm in so, the chair. Uh, just, yeah. Um, I was council, would you that, be upset if I spoke? Remember uh, that other councils have have defeated this, that it's not a big, the one of the bigger um, events that we have. So I just want to remind you of that. I'm not, I can't vote because I'm in the chair, but um, I just want to bring that forward that other councils had defeated it because of, of only keeping them. This would open the door for, um, uh, other events to a request a food truck. And yes, Councillor Hurdle, I see your hand, so you may speak. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Just in the terms of the background, I'm a little unclear how this is worded here. Um, does the moratorium exist as part of the bylaw? I'll have to look at staff for that. Uh, Council, uh, it's Mr. essentially uh, all, any food trucks have to get a peddler's permit and it's not built into the bylaw, but it's been understood that in most instances, we're not to issue them because it's in competition. And it's not necessarily just food trucks. If there's any type of business that sets up, that's kind of in direct competition, competition with local re resellers. We don't tend to allow them, that we'd uh, aim them towards the farmer's market. Otherwise, um, just because of the limited season and stuff, uh, we've used that as our overall scope and when issuing these permits so just just so that i'm clear uh, uh the, the bylaw does not restrict or uh, permit uh, uh food trucks so there's no bylaw it's just basically been a preference of previous councils to limit them to drive business towards uh restaurants in the community but in this case we have re restaurants in the community saying that they're okay with it. just want to be clear on that. that's correct yeah. the, the, the the bylaw isn't specific enough about what is or what isn't allowed it's kind of at the will of council and staff Okay. Does that, does that make it clear to you, Councillor Hurdle? Thank you. It does. Okay. And Councillor Heenan. 
Yes, uh, Deputy Mayor, we also have to realize that this is a tenant of our town as well. So it's not like a food truck coming in independently uh, in total competition to our restaurants and bars. These people are part of our town and have uh, have an establishment. So it's like an add on for them. So it's not like it's not like me coming in and asking for a wiener truck. It's because I haven't got anything in town. These people are part of the town. So to me, it makes a little more sense to think about it, at least of putting it in. Thank you. I just have a question for Mr. Spear. Uh, if we change it that on Sunday, they do not, uh, they cannot go past their 11 o'clock as Councillor Neal suggested, would that be, do we just add a, an amendment or? Yeah, I'd amend the motion to, to say that the operatings are from, I guess from 12 to 12 on Saturday and 12 to 11 on Sunday, if that's, or whatever council wants to put, but that should be an amendment to the motion so we can make it as a condition of the peddler's permit. Friendly amended, is that all right with you, Councillor Neal, since you, I meant you were the one that brought the amendment forth. Council, is that all right with you? Absolutely. Councillor Hurdle? It's okay with minute, you. But, Deputy uh, Mayor, that's, I guess I, that's the motion. Then you should only need a mover in a second to amend that. To amend it? Yeah. Even though it's a friendly amendment? No. It's more official than a friendly, okay. I guess. Sorry. So we need, we need to have an amended that uh, for um, Saturday night, the hours will stay, but for Sunday, it will be from 12 to 11. Uh, so could I have someone amend that? Councillor Neal has agreed to amend it, um, seconded by Councillor Heenan. So now we have to vote on the amendment first. So council um, for the amendment of doing that, all those in favor? And that's everyone. So it's Sorry, board, I apologize. I, I meant to ask a question if I could squeeze it in. Is that oh, still sorry, allowed? Sorry. I, I'm sorry, I thought you were vote. We were voting with us. Yeah, no, sorry. Okay. Um, just like. Go Thank ahead you. and ask uh, a question before we vote. <laughs> my question is, is do, are we aware are we aware of anything that would that's happening on Sunday night that might correspond with the request to have it to 12 o'clock? Like, is there like a partnership, a partnering event of some kind that, that might mitigate our response here? Or you just the, the request came to us just the way that it is. Is there anything you know of uh, Mr. Spear on Sunday not, night? Not to our knowledge. The request came in and we brought it forward as was. So. We're not sure. I guess at that late hour, I'm not sure if there's anything that would go on, but we can ask that question from the uh, to see and bring it forward. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So now can we vote on it? So council, are you in favor of the amendment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And contrary minded? So it's carried. Now we go back to the motion itself um, to allow them to have the, with the amendment. Uh, do we have to have that again approved? Okay, thank you. Um, so council um, to vote on this, uh, to allow them to do it. All those in favor? The amendment, aye. With the amendment, yes. Aye. Aye. And counter reminded? Uh, so it is carried. Thank you, Councillor Hurdle. And you can bring the mayor back. Oh, he's back. He's, he's going to the washroom, I think. <laughs> he is too, little sneak. So shall we wait for him or go on to the next one? Which would be Councillor Hurdle. No, that's Heenan, Councillor Heenan. There's nothing with uh, Recreation and Community Service or Council Boomshell. Yes, there is. Oh, yes, there is. There's a the new one. So we need to add that one too. So Councillor Boomshell. 220908 dated September 15th, submitted by myself. And the subject is appointment of manager of recreation for the town of St. Andrews. And the background reads, staff and council have completed the, hi the hiring process to fill the new position of manager of recreation for the town of St. Andrews. We are proud to introduce Mr. William Kernahan as the new manager of recreation. Mr. Kernahan has a strong background in recreation, museums, and culture. His experience encompasses museums, youth programming, arts, outdoor rec, and experiential recreation tourism for all ages. His collaborative management style tied with his experiences in coaching and training staff and volunteers made Mr. Kernan a strong candidate for selection. 
As part of the municipal process, council can appoint Mr. Kernan to the position of manager of recreation. His anticipated start date is September 26, 2022. And the motion is that council appoints Mr. William Kernan as manager of recreation for the town of St. Andrews. And I would make that motion, your worship. Thank you. Deputy worship, worship. Uh, a seconder for that motion. Councillor Neal, any discussion on that? Okay. All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you very much and uh, welcome aboard. Uh, I guess we'll provide more of a, a comment on what that looks like in an upcoming meeting. So uh, at that, at this particular point, that will take us through business, uh, uh, sorry, that'll take us through business, tourism, heritage and culture and recreation. So we're gonna jump over to planning and economic development. And I will be, because of the nature of it, I will be declaring another conflict on this one. So I'll pass it back over to you, Deputy Mayor Akajit. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Councillor Heenan, your first one. I just got to find my page. Page 72. Okay. Um, Councillor Heenan, Planning and Economic Development Committee Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor and Council. PED 220812 Amendments, MP 20-06, the Municipal Plan, MP 20-01, and Z22-02 to Zoning Bylaw, Z22-01, Compass Housing Incorporated, call for public hearings of objections. At the September the 20th, 2022 regular council meeting, Compass Housing Incorporated provided a site plan for the property located at 302 Mowat Drive for the 42 unit affordable housing project. As part of the Community Planning Act process, an additional public hearing of objection is recommended for the public to provide input on the site plan provided to council. Staff will send a notice out to residents within a 100 meter area around the property and will follow all procedures for notification based on the Community Planning Act for public hearings, hearings of objection. And the motion is that Council sets the date of Monday, October 17th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. at the W.C. O'Neill Arena Council Chambers for a public hearing of objections as per Section 111 of the Community Planning Act on Zoning Bylaw Amendment Z22-02 to the Town of St. Andrews Zoning Bylaw Z22-01 for, for Compass Housing Incorporated at the PID number of 01325521 uh, 302 Mowat Drive to move from tourist commercial zone to multi uh, residential zone, uh, residential two zone. And I so move that, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Heenan. Could we have a seconder, please? Councillor Goodmichel. Any further discussion, Council? Neil, Councillor Neil, sorry. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, um, I guess it's a question for staff is just as per our discussion earlier, is it possible to go ahead with the hearing of objections and kind of separate that from the third and final reading of the? Absolutely. You know, that it's, it's just kind of a best practices that some of the right. questions would have been addressed in more conceptual designs, but I don't know if there's a minimum standard that Xander can ask for for the type of information that's provided. But it's, we just have concerns. I think that some of the public that may attend may not have other, all their questions answered, but right. certainly they are two ind independent things. Is there anything stopping us as a council, I guess, from having a second public hearing in the event or like once we get the final renderings of the exterior? Well, nothing stopping you. This is the second one, by the way. This right. would be a third one that you'd be going, right. which is probably, you know, we'll going go. more. Yeah, it's it's just whatever. I guess the concern that the proponent has, which she was looking for the total rezoning, which I'm not entirely sure we want to do or should do until we have a complete set of renderings. Um, yeah. But, you know, we can go with the site plan she's provided, which will answer a lot of the neighborhood's questions. But she brought up about, um, about patios and things that weren't on the original plans, which will probably create a, mo a few more questions that we won't necessarily be able to answer in this meeting, but it's completely and utterly up to council how they want to proceed. Okay, and just lastly, I, Ms. Bevington's not with us anymore, and um, I may have missed this earlier, but did she give an indication as to how long she needed for those renderings? 
December. December, she said. As she yeah, December. she said it was about December before they would be ready. Okay. okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Council? Oh, I would say. No. Oh, um, Xander? Oh, sorry. There, there's a difference between, I mean, fully done renderings and, and um, I mean, concepts. Like there might be an in between ground that would answer the public's questions without needing, you know, the the full basically like CGI renderings. There could be sketches, and it would be clear that this is going to be this color. And it, I, I guess the council is trying to find a balance of moving ahead with things versus having enough information. That's that's the only kind of middle ground I could think of is. Um, having some flexibility in the type of concepts. And and I know from talking with Mrs. Bevington that she would want to present, present something to the public that um, does answer questions. So I don't think she'd want anything that is going to leave more questions and, and um, not be up to her standards. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Heenan? Yes, Deputy Mayor and Council. Um, we're walking a fine line here between uh, achieving our goal of getting the um, uh, payloader in the ground next spring and, and, and pleasing the public, and it's a very tight rope to walk. And I totally, totally understand this. Um, of course, there's no real compromise. We have to decide one way or the other. But I would like to see a winner on both sides. Like I'd like to see the public be able to win uh, by making sure that it's what they want. But I'd like to see uh, the construction company be able to continue their route as scheduled. Okay. So that's just my thoughts. Thank Councilor you. Uh, Councillor Gomeshell. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Further to uh, Councillor Heenan's points, I, I, I would be... Uh, I'd be very nervous of uh, delaying this at all. Uh, Ms. Bevington has a long, uh, a long uh, proven history of, of producing good buildings that we can all be happy with and proud with, and she's willing to work with staff. Um, I'd fall on the side of uh, getting the uh, excavator in the ground, the payloader, to use your term, uh, in the ground, and uh, I'm sure everyone will be quite happy with it. So I, I prefer not to delay things if possible. Thank okay. you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Councillor Neal, do you have? Any comments? Yeah, I guess, again, I'm just looking at the motion. Again, the motion is simply just to set a date for this public hearing, which I guess, in my opinion, I, I'm fine with going ahead with that. Um, okay. Again, we still have, my suggestion would be, again, we perhaps hold off on the third reading at that moment. Um, I'm thinking of the communications and discussions we've had with the Bridal Path Group, again, to get those sort of streetscape renderings. Um, which again, to Xander's points, are not sort of final drawings, but can still, I think, address a few of the concerns and questions of the public. Okay. Um, and again, I think, you know, worst case, we end up having sort of another public presentation by Ms. Bevington to present that to the public and allow questions. Thank you, Councillor Neal. Councillor Hurdle, do you have anything to add? Um, well, I guess I would uh, I would mostly agree with Councillor Neal on this one. I, I'm just you know my initial re re reaction to it is is uh, concern about uh, the tone of discourse that we've had in the past in town. Uh, just they're very sensitive to how things look, and I'll just be uh, cautious um, to move too quickly ahead without uh, some idea what that looks like. But I guess if we're just talking about you know setting a date, then, then I agree with Councillor Neal. Well, then we will go to the vote. All those in favor for setting the um, uh, hearing of objections uh, for this October 17th? Yes, at 6.30. Up to, at 6.30 here at the arena. Um, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. And so that's everyone. So it's carried for the hearing of objections. Uh, Mr. Spear, you could put that on our list. Thank you very much. And we can invite the mayor back in. Thank you. Councillor Heenan, it is still your go. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, I'll wait. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. You're welcome, Your Worship. Welcome back. Your Worship and Council. My next is PED 220904. New Champlain housing request for proposal discussion. 
the town of St. Andrews in the fall of 2021 issued a request for proposal for an affordable housing development off of Champlain Avenue at PIDs 15199391 and 15191554, town owned lands. A proponent was selected from the RFPs submitted to negotiate with the town. However, we were unable to come to an agreement on the development for this area on the scope of the RFP. With the understanding that affordable housing is a priority of council, staff was directed to create a new RFP for Champlain Avenue that focuses on affordability, accessibility, and energy efficiencies. Provided with this motion report is a draft copy of the new request for proposal for Champlain Avenue. The scoring matrix has been modified to reflect the changes in the RFP and additional emphasis on financial contribution. If Council approves the RFP, staff will look to release it for the month of October to receive new proposals from developers. And the action and motion is that Council approves the new Champlain Avenue request for proposal for release to a pub for released to the public in October of 2022 with a focus on affordability, accessibility, and energy efficiency. And I so move that, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Heenan. And I've got a seconder by Deputy Mayor Akaji. She was quicker than your right side. Um, on this one, any discussion? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. That is everybody, so that has been carried, and we're on to the next set of motions for the third and final subject. 94. So my next is PED 220710, Amendment at MP20-02-01 to the Town of St. Andrews Secondary Municipal Plan, MP20-02 for PIDs 01320035 and 15054893, 256 and 260 Water Street for Bridal Path International Incorporated Second Reading. The background. The Town of St. Andrews has been working through the process of amendment to MP 20-02-01 to the Town of St. Andrews Secondary Municipal Plan MP 20-02 for PIDs 01320035 and 15054893 at 256 and 260 Water Streets from Bridal Path International Incorporated. The proponents are seeking an amendment to the allow for the development of a 12.2 meter, four story, 36 mixed use apartment complex. The following steps would need to be taken as part of the Community Planning Act process. Public presentation was held on July 18th, 2022. First reading of the amendment MP 20-02-01 was July 18th, 2022. Obtained views of the Planning Advisory Committee, which was August 17th, 2022. Call for public hearings of objections held on August 15th, 2022. Second reading and third and final reading. At the 220906 regular council meeting, after the presentation by Mr. John Rocca on the site design change and review of all information from PAC and public hearing of objections, Mr. Gopin presented council with the concept of the development scheme bylaw plan for this property. Council provided consensus on the height with the stipulation of the development scheme bylaw following the direction of council provided is amended version of MP 20-02-01, noting the development scheme bylaw as a requirement in conjunction with the secondary municipal plan amendment. As there is a timeline process to completing the amendment, six months, it is advised council move forward with the amendment process as staff and the developer works towards the development scheme bylaw. With the proposed change to the amendment, another public hearing of objections and calls for views of the planning advisory committee are needed before the third and final reading. And the motion is, that council grants leave for second reading to amendment 
to amended amendment MP 20-02-01 to the Town of St. Andrews Secondary Municipal Plan MP 20-02 for exemption under the HBD section 2.1.2.6 bracket A bracket B back and C for Bridal Path International Incorporated and it's in reference to PIDs 01320035 and 15054893 at 256 and 260 Water Street and I so move this motion. Thank you a seconder for that motion Councillor Neal. Um, we're open for discussion. I guess I'll kick off by a question is uh, Sometimes we have to go back to first reading if there's a significant change, just not adding in the development scheme bylaw to this. Does that not constitute as a significant change to what we would have done at first reading? Or is that because when the last meeting we had, I was under the impression we were going back to first reading. And I was just wondering if this is if this works to go to second reading today. I don't know about the uh, Local Governance Act, but under the Community Planning Act, the only thing that you have to go back to is the public hearing and views of PAC. So you don't have to go back to the first reading. There might be something in the Local Governance yeah. Act, but... Through you, Your Worship, generally speaking, your councils can modify and amend bylaws throughout the reading process up until the third and final reading, which council has done previously under the Local Governance Act. However, this is a Community Planning Act uh, bylaw, so it falls under that act. Perfect. I think coaching in the past has been not to make significant changes between the second and the third reading would be what I've heard in the past, but just uh, making sure that we're okay on that council. Any comment on this one? So I guess it's safe to say that the next step after this would be for um, us to have a copy of the development scheme bylaw before us, before we take after tonight, assuming it goes ahead any further. Is that correct? Um, technically, this amendment is just to say there needs to be a development scheme bylaw before the height requirement is relaxed on okay. the secondary plan. And once the development scheme bylaw is ready, that will also need a uh, public presentation and a public hearing and views of PAC. So it's a long um, process. And uh, I've been in communication with the developer about um, where the development scheme bylaw is going and where he is and what he can submit because he has to figure out his parking. That's that's his big thing. Um, but so now there's still another process for the development scheme bylaw. This is just to amend the amending bylaw. Perfect. And, and just to be clear for the public, uh, just a follow-up question is on assuming all three motions go ahead, Monday, October 17th, the public would have uh, for that an opportunity to see the development scheme bylaw, or would that be mm -hmm. an internal document that only council sees? Uh, through your worship, the, the development, well, the development scheme bylaw would not be prepared yet. The amended bylaw that you'd be reading tonight is what is being presented okay. for uh, views of PAC and the public hearing of objections, which will also be on our website for public. So hearing. the development scheme bylaw itself will, will require all three readings Correct. plus its own hearing of objections. Correct. So two two opportunities and so a public we're going back so basically we've done one this will open the door for two more basically one for the development scheme bylaw and one for this particular motion yeah if we'd started with this amending bylaw that had the development scheme in it then we could have skipped this step but we didn't so here we are <laughs> <laughs> okay perfect thanks i just want to have all the clarity out there because of the change uh, for the public so uh council any questions i know i asked a pile sorry about that all right, I will call the question then. All in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye, your worship. And that is everybody. So uh, I will read it. It's bylaw number MP 20-02-01, a bylaw to amend bylaw number MP 20-02, being the secondary municipal plan bylaw for the town of St. Andrews, be enacted by the council of the town of St. Andrews as follows. Number one, bylaw number MP 20-02, the secondary municipal plan bylaw for the town of St. Andrews is amended by adding the following after schedule B, and that would be schedule C. So number one, notwithstanding any policy or proposal in schedule B, PID 01320035, and 15054893 are exempt from the height requirements of proposals 6A, 6B, 6C, so long as the development scheme bylaw is in force for those PIDs. This was read the first time the 18th day of July 2022 and now has been read the second time the 20th day of September 2022. Next motion. Thank you, Worship and Council. Motion that Council requests 
the view of the Planning Advisory Committee for the Town of St. Andrews as per Section 110 of the Community Planning Act to Amendment MP 20-02-01 to the Town of St. Andrews Secondary Municipal Plan MP 20-02 for exemption under HBD Section 2.1 point two point six bracket a bracket b and c for bridal path international incorporated pids are zero one three two zero zero three five and pid one five zero five four eight nine three at two five six and two six zero water street i so move your worship and once again i'll be looking for a seconder counselor neil he keeps beating you by a bit tonight counselor michelle Okay, uh, any discussion on this one? Okay, I will call the question. All in favor of the second motion, please indicate by saying aye. aye. It's everybody, and now we're on to the final motion of the evening, I believe. Thank you, Your Worship. Motion, the council sets the date of Monday, October the 17th, 2022 at 6.45 p.m. or immediately following the previous public hearing of objections at the WC Arena Council Chambers for public hearing of objections as per section 111 of the Community Planning Act to amend amendment MP 20-02-01 to the Town of St. Andrews second secondary municipal plan MP 20-02 for exemption under H BD section 2.1.2.6 bracket A bracket B and C for Bridal Path International Incorporated PIDs 01320035 and 1505483 at 256 and 26 Water Street. I so move. Thank you. A seconder for that motion. Deputy Mayor Akaji. Oh, I'm sorry. I hear you. <laughs> Good discussion on this last motion. Seeing none, call the question. All in favor? That's everybody. And that has been uh, passed. So at this particular time, that wraps up the motions uh, for this evening. Uh, we uh, now are, have nothing under new business because we already dealt with that issue. Or do you have something you'd like to add? Okay. I, Back to the RFP. I slept through it so fast as you guys are going through it, but I, there were no dates put in, and we're just wondering what type of timeline you'd like between its release and when it closes. So typically they're 30 or 60 days, is that correct? But in this type, it's a development. There's a lot of planning. So I think the, the minimum should be 60 days. There's a lot to, to figure that one out. Um, does is that does that seem like a realistic time frame? I'll get council consensus, but uh, Sandra, I think so. you see these quite often as 60 days kind of a yeah, I, I think 60 days is is good. And if and I, you know, there might be some people who are already thinking about it and and are getting stuff ready. So I but I think giving, you know, it doesn't hurt to give more time. Yeah. Uh, any councillors see any uh, difference or deputy mayor between 60 days? I think that's what it was the first time. Yeah, so I think it's only 30 or, or 35. Well, I, I'm seeing no argument. So 60 days it is. And that way it gives people appropriate time to really put planning and resources behind it to put in a good uh, RFP, hopefully for affordable housing in St. Andrews. Thank you, Your Worship. You're welcome. Um, all right. So that's it for new business then. So we are in question period at this particular time. Um, I'll let you look online to see if there's anything. But while we ask the room, is there any questions for anyone in the room this evening? Come on up, sir. Uh, there's no microphone per se, is there? So good evening, Mayor and Deputy Mayor Akaji and members of the council. I'm Douglas Greenaway and I reside at 62 Princess Royal. You probably gotten very used to me by now in the same block as Bridal Pass proposed project. And I rise to speak again on behalf of now 25 households who submitted two letters to the council regarding the project. So the first question is um, to date, while the town clerk has acknowledged receipt of the letter we delivered on August 15th, We've not received a response and we're wondering when we might anticipate a response to that letter. I think both that letter and the letter of questions will be important for the future hearing of objections, which 
you've just scheduled unless I've heard incorrectly for October 17th. Is that correct? Correct, October 17th. Right. Yeah. So I'm um, just wondering when we might anticipate a response to that. I think that, uh, again, I'll lean on staff, but I think that would probably be something that is uncovered as they actually develop the development scheme bylaw, because a lot of that would be addressed within that agreement. Would that be safe to say, Mr. Spear? Yes, Your Worship, that a lot of the questions weren't being able to answer, especially where council was still only at first reading. We'd advised the group that we're waiting to see what council's decision was, if they were going through with the amendment, because it's very specific details that were asked. So we'll pull it out and revisit it again tomorrow, just to see if there's anything in it that we can ask. Um, I guess it does go back to the development scheme bylaw. If this goes through three readings, that the, the, the amendment, that that'll be a chance to really get into those details. And we can look at your questions again and see if that might be a more appropriate time to provide feedback. But you know, we appreciate it now, but we have to kind of, a lot of the stuff is very specific to the developer, which at this point we can't speak in their behalf. And he was just looking for some assurances through the amendment, because if the amendment wasn't going to go through, he probably wasn't going to continue on. So we had to wait to see council's um, feeling on that. And so that going to second reading, you know, we have a little more faith that it may make it to third and so in final reading. So we can start to look at that and see if there's some questions that we can answer if there are some that are still going to have to wait to the next phase, which is still going to be very transparent and uh, will require a lot more in-depth uh, uh, questions and, and detail that we may or may not have right now. So we really appreciate the effort at transparency. Um, the first set of, uh, uh, or the first letter sent on August 15th is not so much questions, but um, issues that we've raised that we think warrants a response. So if you take a look at that first letter, we think it, you can consider some responses to that. In the second set of, uh, the second letter that we sent, on September 6th with the 22 questions. I think there are questions, if you look at those again, some that you can answer, they're broad, they're, um, they, they are um, reflective of concept. Uh, and then there are, of course, very specific questions. Um, I do want, in the interest of transparency from our, uh, from the group, question number 16, um, you won't have it in front of you, but it addresses issues of stormwater runoff. And um, we thought there was just one drain. There are three drains. Um, and I believe that uh, uh, one of our um, households sent a photograph maybe to Mr. Noper. Um, if not, we'll resend it. But it shows flooding on Princess Royal Street, even with the three stormwater drains. So please, if you take a look at question 16, think of not one drain, but three drains in that location. Um, we're glad to hear that you are moving forward with the development scheme bylaw. Uh, we think that will add a level of transparency for not only you, but for the, the uh, developer as well, and allow for uh, public uh, engagement with both you and the developer. And then finally, I wanted to sort of get a, a little sense from council, or we wanted to get a sense from council. Um, there have been a range of variance requests to the town plan, and the 25 households are curious um, how the council views the plan in light of growing pressure for further development in the town. So is this simply guideposts for the council, or do you consider it a much more serious document in shaping where development goes um, in the town? Yeah, so I don't know if any specific counselor would like to answer their views because I, I can't, I've specifically not asked them that entirely question, but just generally speaking, uh, a municipal plan and a secondary municipal plan are guiding documents for your community. So to your point, uh, you want to respect them as much as possible. With that being said, uh, it is a balance between priorities in the community um, because there's a lot of time where you can read a municipal plan and, and have reasons to say this is okay. And then there's reasons that will say that this isn't okay if you read a different section. Um, but generally speaking, um, myself, I, I do find it, uh, the process a little challenging when you do a secondary municipal plan and you can just drop a property off that. I, I, I do see why the neighbors have concern on that. And that's my personal opinion. Um, but that being said, I also know that... Um, 
it can be quite restrictive for development. Uh, St. Andrews has had a reputation as not being a development friendly community for a very, very long time. Some of that's for a very good reason. We've been able to keep a lot of our heritage intact. And I think it's a balance to, to the point um, is we want to protect what we have. But in the same sense, uh, what we've been currently doing isn't working for our community. There's less and less people uh, able to actually live in our community, afford to live, and uh, we're seeing more uh, people, and it's good to have new members, but almost every property for sale seems like it's being purchased for people outside the community now because people locally almost can't afford it. So um, it's a balance, but to this specific property, there's higher end pricing, so it doesn't really fit that model. So there's a lot to weigh in about it. I can tell you just to, to talk about the plan. The other thing council's talking about is actually implementing a heritage bylaw for the downtown business district. So um, with a, it, it, it's one of those things that's really tough for council. I know they're struggling with it to preserve heritage, but also make these developments possible. So that's just my own view. Um, uh, there's concern. I've always said that I, I support development, but it's gotta be done the right way. And I'm hoping through the development scheme process that we're able to answer a lot of the questions that the neighbors have that are, are signed that letter because there's a lot of good questions in that, that email. It's just the per first step was determining, are you comfortable with the height? There's no point getting into the weeds of the details until we know we're on board for that first major because if the height wasn't there, there's no point debating the rest because it's not going to go ahead. So what I heard from council is the height is something that they're considering. So we need to start getting into some of those details that are in your question as well as part of the development scheme bylaw. Anything that staff would like to add or council or anything on that? Just um, as, as somebody who was involved in creating the bylaws, I they I think they are treated very seriously by council. And what's happening right now is the process to amend it. So it's not that council can just say, you know, we're not we're going to ignore it. It's it's there's a clear public process, a long public process um, as we've been going through for months now and we'll continue to go through for another few months so i think what the community planning act does is say if you're going to change these documents and deviate from them um there's a lot that you have to do and a lot to consider and and i think as we go through this that's what council is doing so um it's not that they're seen as as guidelines that can be ignored it's that um there's a level of seriousness and for example a variance under the zoning bylaw generally doesn't go before council it goes before pac doesn't take longer than two months. Um, the public polling is only 100 meters. It's not doesn't have to be announced on the website. So with these documents, municipal plans and secondary municipal plans, there's a lot more um, that has to go into changing them. And um, but as the mayor is saying, things do change, and, and there are times when you do want to amend them. And the Community Planning Act lays out the process for that. I think just to follow up on that more is it, it's a challenge of the secondary municipal plan because if this development was on the block before where the where the Kennedy Inn is, then they're off to the they're, they could be off to building it essentially. The, the only reason that they had to come before council was because of the height on that particular block. So, you know, what I mean, it is a balance game to, to the point is is how do you not alter a neighborhood, but in the same sense. If you think of people that want to be mobile, they want to be close to downtown. It's a walkable community. So we, as you can see, I'm wrestling with it myself. And I think a lot of members of council are as well. So I appreciate the um, thoughtful response. And I certainly appreciate um, my colleague, um, Mr. Gopin. Um, just FYI, I've a uh, graduate degree in architecture and practice for a number of years, so we share a commonality. I think what's really would be useful for the council is to spend some time thinking through the dynamics of the secondary plan and what does that mean for you all as leaders of this community in your need to be responsive to the community. The 25 households have very strong opinions about the height. Um, the, the, both the, the questions uh, letter and the initial letter that we sent um, probably doesn't bang that too hard, but uh, there is a great deal of concern about uh, changing the height uh, because of the downtown historic character. So we thank your continued consideration and thoughtful and careful consideration. Um, everyone in this community loves this community and want to see the right kind of development on that lot, as well as other lots in this community. So we thank you for your time. And Perfect. And thank you for okay, Thank you for your time. It was the last uh, subject on the uh, the docket tonight, and question period is always the end. So appreciate your time as well. Uh, yes, another question. 
Sorry, I just have a question. Thank you for letting me educate myself on how you run your business, how you run our town, how we left you to run our town. And so far, I've been so pleased with the openness of it. My name is Liz Ir Irwin Kenyon. And just have a couple of questions while I've listened to debates and discussion tonight. One is, how many restaurants were pulled when asked about the truck? Does anybody know how I'll, many restaurants were? Five or six out of how many restaurants? The one in the town. Uh, your, your worship, they was pulled within the residential block of the downtown, specifically where there are six res or six restaurants right within the block. And there were no ma major concerns. The biggest concern that was brought forward was as long as they're not uh, their menu is not the same as what is being offered that they were open to that because it's a different offering very something very similar to what the farmers market provides because uh, we have different uh, Korean barbecues uh, Indian food different varieties of restaurants that don't offer those and that's where the restaurants were open to that so we pulled within the vicinity of where the event would take place okay thank you for clarifying that the other one was the young lady with the um, uh, the new development uh, out on Millet Drive and she was talking about um, it wasn't on the in the town plat, the historic plat, but either was Tim Hortons, and Tim Hortons was made to, you know, I mean, was readily asked to to develop its its look so that it fit in with the town. And then just one, uh, the third one, and I think I'll probably going to forget it, but maybe not. Oh yeah, which is the parking of this new bridal development. Um, and that is, I've lived in apartments before in various cities where we had underground parking, but in the summer, in the spring, in the fall, I didn't want to have to try to park between those posts, so I often parked outside. And so that is another 34 potential 64 people or 34 cars with their family and their friends that will be parking on the street. And this summer was atrocious in terms of the parking of Princess Royal and Water Street. It was a danger to try to pull out there at all. So um, to me, that's something that I'm hoping you'll really look at that whole parking area there because we've had major accidents there before and a death there too. So it's something, and thank you so much for letting me speak. Mm -hmm. Probably red cheeks, but uh, you know, <laughs> thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you thank you for staying the whole meeting as well. Um, anyone else? <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Peter Petrosich. I'm new to the town. Moved here from Hamilton, beginning of June. And the height restriction here just concerns me because I came from a community where it was developers threatening to go to uh, municipal board to try and get restrictions lifted. And they go, no, we just want one more story. But it doesn't stop there. It goes from three to four to eight. And next thing you know, you're looking at high rises. And I'll tell you, I sure as hell didn't move here and look at high rises. Okay, so you got to be careful of the precedents you set. Just as you have set a precedent here tonight with your food truck. You're quite correct, uh, sorry, <laughs> Deputy Mayor, that what about the next one? Are you going to go pull restaurants every time someone wants a food truck now? You know, like, and you're thinking, okay, move it back to 11 o'clock. Well, you know, like, I, I see, I think it's a red herring. They close their kitchen about three hours before they close their business because there's time to clean up and there's noise and all that goes along with it. You haven't really thought it through, in my opinion. Okay? You're setting precedents because the next one come around and say, hey, you did it for them. It wasn't a big event. And how are you going to argue that? Okay? So... I don't know. Like, I love this town. Believe me, we put, you know, a lot of time, a lot of effort. We've hauled, you know, 1,500 kilometers to come and live here. And I hope that what we're getting is what we, you know, we're, we're what we saw on the websites and the town and all that. Okay. And I was, I was once upon a time a school board trustee. And I know that my oath was to do what was best for the board for that body. And it wasn't to do what's best for my children 
or the people elected me or the people who gave me a donation. It's what's do what's best for the board. I ended up with three kids in three different schools because I voted the right way. And I'm hearing a little too much leaning toward making sure developers aren't held back and putting a shovel in the ground as opposed to the public who elected you. They should be the priority. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Pre appreciate your comments. I, I will say just in counter to that, since uh, since it was, I guess, not really a question, but more of a comment. But just to be clear, we are hearing it both ways. It's it's not just people saying don't build. There's a lot of people in the community encouraging us to do this. And every single one of these people who got elected said housing was their number one priority. So this isn't completely a, a new thing, but I do take your points. Um, if you look at the secondary municipal plan, if bridal path solutions was to go forward, that is your new standard for height in that block. And the next person could come and ask for a variance slightly higher than that. So points well taken and, and thank you for attending tonight as well. Any other questions? Anything online? I've received, uh, your worship, I've received nothing through email and uh, it's just uh, Ms. Bevington and family on for attendees. So Perfect. one last thing. Thank you very much. They've had the chance. Mr. Knopper, uh, I'll go to Councillor and Deputy Mayor's comments. Um, Deputy Mayor Akaji. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just want to thank the Anglican Church and Archdeacon mm -hmm. Matheson for the uh, service and the Legion members and all their hard efforts for putting on the um, service on uh, Monday at 11 o'clock uh, at the Cenotaph. Uh, a lot of work went into it and to thank our town staff because they set up, they tear down, um, they work overtime and at they were there in person. Thank you, Mr. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Knopper, and everybody else who was there to set up chairs, take chairs down, etc. The mayor was there to give his warm welcome, and um, and uh, so I really appreciate that that was done for the Queen, uh, even though I'm not quite a loyalist. But sorry about that, but um, it was a very nice presentation, a very nice service, and well done. And I'd like to remind you of September the 30th, which is coming on fast. It's a Friday night and um, we, had, we in conjunction with the uh, chief of the um, Beskato Makati people here in St. Andrews have off, will be offering a, um, like we did last year, a gathering at, in, on Indian Point um, at six o'clock and everyone is invited. I'd like to see, and rather than just a sea of orange, maybe a global whole thing of or an earth of orange, where we wear the t-shirts to remember those um, who attended residential schools, those that didn't come back, those that did come back with uh, a lot of baggage. And uh, we just don't want to forget them and the truth and reconciliation that was done in, I believe, 94. So all of these things are gonna be very pertinent. So. We will gather at 6 p.m. on Indian Point, and we will um, have a memory for uh, those residential school survivors, those residential school people who didn't come back, children who didn't come back. So please wear your orange t-shirt on that day. I've been wearing mine beforehand because I want people to know that it wasn't just the one day, like they chose the 30th of September, and it's wonderful to see but we certainly don't want to forget, and I don't think we will forget, but I do ask that you attend even in your community. I know that St. Stephen University is going to do something during the day. We decided at six o'clock and uh, we will be there at the point. So I look forward to meeting with you and um, you know, remembering those, those uh, children. October the 4th is Sisters in Spirit. And if you don't know what that is, Google it, but, um, it again is another celebration, not a celebration, but a remembrance of uh, missing and murdered um, children. Uh, not a nice thing to remember, but we don't want to forget those things that are happening. So um, although there will be no formal um, celebration, the day is observed all throughout Canada and, and North America. So uh, remember sisters in spirit. So thank you very much, your worship. Thank you. For and your, thank you for attending. Thank you for drawing awareness, but also your leadership and helping uh, those days be recognized in our community. Uh, any other member of council? I've got Councillor Hurdle. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, your worship. I just wanted to um, 
draw attention to the fact that we all know that we had a, a very busy summer as we uh, continue to bounce back from, from the pandemic. And uh, the first faces that a lot of people in our community saw were uh, the volunteers at the Welcome Center. So I just wanted to take a second and just recognize some of the volunteers that were there over the summer and help welcome people into our community, uh, guide them around the community as well, and direct them to you know the best experience they could have here in St. Andrews. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to Doug Nash, uh, no stranger to all of us here, uh, to Barry Murray, uh, to Betty Ann Lord, to Ann McIntosh, to uh, Michael Lefty Morrill, and Dave Lord as well. And though technically not a volunteer, uh, but our summer uh, seasonal employee there or for the chamber there was uh, uh, Allie Wilcoxon as well, of course, uh, Julia Havlai for all the wonderful work that she does uh, uh, for the chamber and for uh, the Welcome Center there over the summertime. So thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor Hurdle. Any other councillor? Okay, I do have one uh, announcement that I wanted to draw awareness to is um, the Union of Municipalities has their conference coming up. It's Thanksgiving weekend, um, but they have awarded the Raymond Murphy Memorial Award. So the Union of Municipalities only gives away, I believe it's four major awards or three, just two, just two major awards every year. And uh, this is about uh, basically like a lifetime award for your dedication and volunteerism to your community. And uh, pleased to see that Chris Fleming actually received that from the Union of Municipalities. So uh, Chris, uh, a lot of you uh, that know was a longtime teacher here in, at Sir James Dunn Academy. Um, he has lots of experience uh, at this very table being uh, a former mayor as well as counselor. He uh, is the chair of our planning advisory committee. Uh, but no strangers to organizations like CHGO, who's here. He is one of the fundamental people that helped get it up and keep it going for a number of years. And there's actually a series that CHGO is doing where Chris Fleming is, is aired and talks about the days as well with Brian Dixon of things that they accomplished. Uh, and uh, myself, I got to know him when I moved back to town as he was volunteering for the Chamber of Commerce. He's uh, volunteered at Kingsbury Garden. He has done so many things, and I know I'm leaving some off the, the list, but uh, you know, as, uh, as he goes through the battle that he's doing right now, I think the whole town and the council is uh, behind him and thinks that this is well-deserved, and uh, I just want to highlight his contributions and that major award that he's received. Once again, it's the Raymond Murphy Memorial Award uh, from the Union of Municipalities, and again, one of their only two awards that they give to the entire province annually, so very, very good recognition for him and well-deserved. Uh, at this time, then, uh, it is 8.16 p.m. I'm going to move that council goes into closed session for the Local Governance Act 68-1J, which is a labor and employment matter, including the negotiation of collective agreements. I'll be looking for a mover to go into closed session. I've got Councillor Gumichel and seconded by Councillor Hurdle. Um, all in favor of going to closed session? Aye. We are now in closed session. We'll give a moment just to close everything down. Thank you. Thanks, CHCOP. You're telling me you're great. I'll be looking for a motion this evening to come at a closed session. Oh, okay. I've got Councillor Neal and Councillor Gumichel because I tend to look right Neil first. Uh, all in favor of coming at a closed session, please signify by saying aye. aye. We're out of closed session. I'd be, be very honored if one of you would make a motion to adjourn. Deputy Mayor Akaji is always seconded by Councillor Gumichel. Actually, I'm going to rebuttal that. Councillor hurdle we're going to give that to you all in favor of adjourning please signify by saying aye aye this meeting has been adjourned thank you for your time this evening council thank you